بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبيه الكريم um, Distinguished guests, our learned scholars, distinguished guests and, uh, and uh, audience, the interpreters as well and the, uh, the technician team, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That means peace be upon you all and very good evening. We gather here tonight for a good purpose. That is to seek knowledge and to develop our skills and our understanding of a very important topic that is about ethics from a secular and also religious perspective where our distinguished speakers will address the issue of the fundamentals of ethics and the challenges ahead. But before we start, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for, to you all for being here tonight. And also on behalf of the center, I would like to thank you for attending our activities. And of course, it's always our pleasure to have you with us and to interact with you and to keep in touch, not only during the, the event itself, which is a public panel or public lecture, but also during the year, we are still around. We have a website, we have some publications, we have lots of events, so we would like to always seek your support and see you uh, with us. Uh, specifically, actually, we wanted to, why we are organizing this public panel, it's uh, the, the, the topic of ethics nowadays it's, is vital especially in view of what is going on in the world of you know problems and the decay of moralities and and what we see of you know the destruction of human beings war uh, political hegemony uh, poverty uh, injustice inequalities and so on and so forth so it's always important to talk about the ethical elements and the ethical perspectives you know to what we are facing and the to the problems that we are facing and more importantly is not uh, more importantly is not to address those issues from one perspective only but also to have you know different perspectives and tonight we have three outstanding or worldly renowned speakers coming from different parts of the world, and it's our pleasure to introduce them briefly, and then I will introduce them in, in a bit of details later on. on. But from I, I will start from my left side, Dr. Uh, Michaela Nullinger from Austria. She is an expert in ethics. She is, uh, she is also, uh, 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 she has a variety of experience and background. And to my right side, Dr. Steve Long, from the States, from the United States of America. And he, he, he is also an outstanding you know, uh, speaker and also uh, a professor in a university uh, level. And uh, at the far end from there, it's Dr. Uh, uh, Edward Mu'ad. He is from Qatar University. He is an associate professor of uh, philosophy. Why we talk about uh, you know, the fundamentals of religious and secular ethics it's always important you know in any education setup in any discipline it's is to understand the fundamentals because sometimes you know we jump and we think that we know many things but actually we do need from time to time to go back to the fundamentals especially at the same time when we address them at once from different perspectives that's number one and number two I mean, without understanding the discipline itself, we cannot really move forward. And that's very important. In addition to this, it's also uh, important to know the challenges ahead. Because when we talk about the future, yes, we understand perhaps the discipline is good, is good but it's also uh, a necessity to know the challenges, what are the challenges, and also how to address them and how to go through them so that we can always you know grow and 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 develop so with this brief uh, introduction i would like to start with uh, our first uh, speaker will be uh, dr steve long 
Dr. Steve Long uh, is um, a university professor of ethics uh, at Southern Methodist University in the States. He previously worked at uh, Market University, uh, uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, St. Joseph's University, and Duke uh, Divinity School. He received his PhD uh, from Duke University. He works in the intersection of theology and ethics and has published around 50 works, 50 articles, but 15 books. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> and uh, and all they are all in uh, the field of uh, ethics and theology, including uh, divine economy, uh, theology and the market, uh, goodness of God, um, theology, church, and social order, um, uh, calculated future, futures, uh, Christian ethics, uh, very short introduction, um, uh, very short introduction to Christian ethics, I think, yes. And the p uh, perfectly simple uh, triumph, God, uh, Aquinas and, and his legacy, and um, Augustinian ethical Christian ethics, uh, and um, on, loving, on loving enemies. So Dr. Steve will, 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 will share with us his uh, knowledge, his insights, and his experience also as a, as a university professor. So the Professor uh, Steve, you have 50, uh, 20 minutes, so please address the audience, and okay. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here at the center. It's been a delight to be here the last couple of days and to interact and hear the conversation. So I've, I'm here n n not just to um, offer a presentation, but to learn, and I've learned a great deal already. So I, I hope to continue that tonight and tomorrow. My topic today, or my topic this evening, is religious and secular ethics, fundamentals and challenges. And I'll speak primarily about the situation in in the Western philosophical and theological context. The relationship between religious and secular ethics is one of the most contested in Western and uh, philosophical and theological debates. And a major reason for this contested character is the fundamental point, how should or should a religious ethic approach the modern era, modernity? Is modernity something to embrace and thus consistent with an ethics grounded in faith? Or does it pose some kind of crisis, a crisis for faith? Now, if you take the former position, that it's something to be embraced and doesn't have any conflict or crisis with a theological or religious ethic, then there's really no reason to, to change or revise or reform. You simply see modernity and Christianity or modernity and religion in general as consistent with one another. But if you think it poses some kind of crisis for faith, then it'll be important to identify what, what the crisis is so that we'll know how to do ethics in response in some way to the crisis. And, and by modernity, I, I mean the, the conditions that make secularity possible. Now, this is a very contested issue, so uh, realize that I, am, I have 20 minutes to address an issue that uh, uh, you know, takes up volumes in the library. So um, I'm, I know everything won't be adequate, but I hope it might at least create a conversation. Before exploring these two options, let me, however, mention that the concept of the secular, the secular, was no stranger to Christianity. In fact, you might say we invented it. It became identified in the modern era as the dominant political, cultural, and social way of organizing society. But the term secular comes from the Latin seculum, most of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with this. And the term seculum simply means a length of time. That's all that the word means in Latin. Theologically, it became identified with the time in Christian theology between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. 
that became known as the saculum, the length of time in which, according to St. Augustine, there will be two cities or two, two nations, two groups of people, uh, broadly speaking, that will have to interact with each other. The city of God, represented by the church, and the world. And the world is also called the saculum. So there's sort of two connotations to the word the saculum in Christian theology. It's this time, and it's the time in which the church and the world has to learn how to negotiate, come together for some common goods and loves, but will also have a, a divergence in its ethics. In fact, the term secular if, if I've taught in, I'm, I am a Protestant, but I've taught in several Catholic institutions. And the term secular is still present among the Roman Catholic clergy who are divided between what's called the regular clergy and the secular clergy. This can be very confusing for people who think, well, what are the secular clergy particularly, you know, anti-religious? Uh, no, that's not the meaning of the term. The regular clergy just means that they are under a regula, a rule in Latin. So they take certain vows that the secular clergy don't take. So secular clergy don't live in a community, they don't live in a, a they, they, they can own their own property, which is one of the identifying characteristics, and they're called the secular clergy. The term secular then was originally a concept about time. It's the time in which the church lives in the world, which the church is both for and against, and it has to figure out how to be both for and against, seeking to navigate their differences. I'm going to call this the ancient secular and contrast it with the modern secular, because gradually the secular took on a new meaning beginning in the 16th century, and the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, was one movement that influenced this new meaning. As the Catholic philosopher Charles Taylor and many others have noted, the reformers gave a new affirmation to everyday life. On the one hand, this new affirmation was very positive in the exercise of the religious vocation. It's no longer primarily lived out in monastic life, but in everyday life. So the Christian has a responsibility to express his or her faith in the political, economic, and familial realm, in the secular, the saculum. On the other hand, the concept of reform, of reformation, took on a life of its own beyond that of the theological, such that the world became envisioned, and this is how the reformers unintentionally helped create the modern era. Uh, the world became envisioned not so much as the divine handiwork, as, a, as a, another script by which you understood God. But the world became not creation, but nature. And nature in terms of natural, a natural realm of raw resources that only held meaning when our will imposes a form upon it. So the constant sense of reform in the modern era. Everything always has to be made new. A new form constantly, ceaselessly, has to be placed upon the world because otherwise it has no meaning. It was this latter transition that led to the exclusive humanism that characterizes the modern secular. Exclusive humanism would argue that the only ethical agency we have is found in the human being in terms of an imminence, that there's no necessary transcendent reference we need to express or understand the human. We can take the human as it is, independent of his or her relation to God, and develop ethics from this exclusive human humanism. Now, very few of any Christian theologians or ethicists would embrace exclusive humanism. Yet some have argued that the key institutions of the modern secular pose no crisis to theological ethics. These institutions, like the democratic nation state, the capitalist economy, offer intentionally a very thin conception of the good. And they offer a thin conception of the good because there's no common agreement about what the good, about what it means to be a human. And so it's a very thin conception and within that thin conception, 
each community, each individual is to pursue his or her or even their own good, including the, the good that God is. So that good, as, as Taylor mentioned, becomes a, a preference, one, one option among others, which is how he characterizes the secular. God becomes one option among others, not excluded, but also not, um, not universally acknowledged. Now, there are a number of Reformed thinkers out of the tradition of John Calvin, the Reformed theology, who argue that this is a good thing. It's a good thing because it critiques authoritarianism. It doesn't allow a, a, a synthetic relationship between the church and the government, so no bishop, no... Um, they're, they're Protestant reform, so, so no pope gets to impose any idea of the good on everyone. So a number of Calvinist thinkers think this is a very good thing, and what it allows for is a flourishing of various religious communities, each seeking his or her own good, with the state not having any obligation to do anything other than preserve civil society, the freedom within which these communities can all sort of vie in the marketplace of ideas. So there are a number of, of uh, reform thinkers who say that Christianity is actually a necessary foundation for modernity. And these would be reformed Calvinist thinkers, although in the 20th century, a number of Roman Catholic thinkers in America also began to develop this idea that this was consistent with Catholicism. In the early part of the 20th century, Americanism was condemned by the Roman Catholic Church as a form of modernism. But slowly, both Catholic and Calvinist thinkers came together and thought this was good. Now, there, there are also secular thinkers who think that reform Christianity created the secular. But these secular atheist thinkers would argue that Christianity is no longer necessary foundation for modernity. This is called the secularization thesis, and it argues that what we have is a gradual progress of rationalization where religious belief, which is taken to be understood as superstition and irrational, is overcome. And this is the inevitable fate. This is what defines progress for some secular thinkers. Um, so, so the reason that they, that they would actually affirm the Reformation of Protestant Christianity is because Protestant Christianity critiqued all the other religions. It critiqued things like pilgrimages, relics, icons, and it, it, it reduced Christianity to kind of bare minimum. And then eventually for the, these thinkers in the secularization thesis, it turned upon itself and, and sort of Christianity died on its own. Now, one of the reasons for this position, the secularization thesis, where, where Christianity leads to secularism, but it then disappears. It's not necessary as a foundation. One of the reasons for this, or actually several reasons for this, is these thinkers argue that certain things occurred in the 16th, 17th century, which created a crisis for Christianity and for religious faith in general that it could not address. One of those things occurred was the Lisbon earthquake mass human suffering and evil. So a philosopher, Susan Nyman, traces the origin of modernity and secularism to the Lisbon earthquake and the new response it cre creates. She sides with August Comte's view of intellectual history as pro progressing from theological to metaphysical to scientific ages. And she states this, this is what constitutes a secular ethic for her, quote, Modern conceptions of evil were developed in the attempt to stop blaming God for the state of the world and to take responsibility for it on our own. So what happens is we don't blame God for evil. Evil's there. God evidently isn't doing anything about it, according to her, so now it's up to us. And so th you can see how this leads to the kind of exclusive humanism. There are other trajectories of this position where... Um, uh, what, what leads to secularization is taking over theological ideas and flattening them out and making them imminent. 
And two of, 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 of these are, are well, one, one crucial idea is that of eschatology. The idea that in the end, God will restore all things. In Isaiah 65, there's this statement about what happens when God returns to Jerusalem and all the nations of the world come together and they bring their wealth to it. And it says, God will bring the wealth of nations. Now, you may have heard about a book by that topic, Adam Smith in 1776. Few people realize there's a sort of tacit claim there to a theological idea, the wealth of nations that if we just implement these policies, we'll get what theology promised but never delivered, the wealth of nations. And many people, Karl Lewitt in particular, a German thinker, argued that to understand Karl Marx and his desire for a communist society, you have to see the eschatological ideas of Christianity being transformed away from the church, away from faith, flattened out and extended to this imminent society. This is what will give your life meaning, the global market or the coming communist society. One other uh, theological, um, one other secularization thesis was that put forward by Hans Blumenberg, who argued that the problem with Christianity was that it never resolved the, the Gnostic heresy. The Gnostic heresy was this idea that um, creation's fundamentally evil. We sort of fall into creation. So it collapses fall in creation. And, and what you have, to, you have to overcome the body because it sort of traps, it traps the light, it traps divinity. And uh, uh, it's, it's so, you know, so, so life is the problem. And sometimes death is the answer. It's kind of a, you know, not very hopeful. Um, this Gnostic heresy, he says, keeps returning in Christianity, and finally in the, in the 16th, 17th century it occurs, and they can't resolve it. And so what resolves it, Christianity's inability to resolve the Gnostic problem, is, is, is uh, um, taken over by the secular, which resolves it by understanding freedom, freedom as self-assertion the self-assertion of the will. Now, what a lot of these traditions all agree upon is that what defines the modern secular is a voluntarism, a focus on the will. The will gives the world meaning through the form it imposes on things. And uh, you, you, you see this, at least in, in, in Western forms of uh, organizing society. So those, those are various versions of a second type of secularism, which says secularism destroys religious ethics, puts an end to it, because religious ethics can't answer these questions. There's a third type I want to uh, discuss and then draw some conclusions. And this third type says that there, it has some similarity to this claim that, that Gnosticism re reappears in the, in the early modern era, but it argues that Unlike Blumenberg, it says we do have theological resources to respond to it. Uh, the Catholic thinker Cyril O'Regan draws upon this, and he says that part of it, and, and, and he associates it with the philosopher Hegel, if you've ever read any Hegel. Um, and and uh, for O'Regan, the modern Gnostic return is the repetition in modern discourses of a narrative that focuses on the vicissitudes of divine reality's fall from perfection. This is a kind of a Gnostic idea that God in God's own being sort of falls, if you will, into humanity, gets taken over by humanity, and then gets restored to divinity. So that in one sense, you, you'll even hear some Western philosophers and theologians make the claim that we heal God. We heal God in God's brokenness. And now that's not a, a common theme among Christian theologians, but you will find it on the margins. And it's part of this ancient, no, uh, this ancient Gnostic, this, this modern Gnostic return. Now, O'Regan thinks that this is, one, once you have that idea, um, it, it, it creates, what, what constitutes deity now? What constitutes the divinity is the species of the humanity. So the species of the humanity constitutes divinity. And once that happens, you can see how that fits with this idea that uh, uh, you're going to have an imminent ethic based upon human self-assertion. So moder modernity poses a crisis. But O'Regan, 
like another uh, theologian, John Milbank, argues that we don't have to capitulate to this, that this is actually a Christian heresy, that the secular was never secular. It was always religious. And what we have to do is show that the secular was, in fact, is now and will be religious, that the religious ideas have migrated to these other institutions. And once we demonstrate that and show it, then we can show the viability of a better theological ethic. Um, Charles Taylor also addresses this idea in his work. And, and he's, Charles Taylor is one who, neither, who argues that we neither need to, what, what he calls, knock modernity or boost it. We don't need a narrative of decline as if everything was great in the Middle Ages and it's been downhill since then. I mean, that's hard to sustain. Nor do we need to believe that everything was horrible back then and they were waiting around for, you know, people to turn the lights on at the Enlightenment. Uh, you know, so, so we don't need knockers or boosters, but we need to sort of recognize what's happened. That our world has become flat in this imminent frame. And what we need to do is to show people that there is a kind of fullness. Now let me then return in conclusion to the, what I call the ancient secular, the Augustinian ethics. So how do we move forward once this has happened? Prior to 16th century, nobody really thought in the West that God was dead. But now we live after the death of God in the West. And it's not like we can sort of put the genie back in the bottle and make everything you know, sort of okay. So how do we respond? I would suggest that what we respond is this third theological thesis that we, we, we try to demonstrate that the secular was never secular, it was always religious, and that we can offer a, a theological account that can accept the gains made by the secular and modernity without some of the negativities. And that would require thinking again about Augustine's ancient secular and the fact that we are going to live in two cities, metaphorically speaking. And, in, and we have obligations in both of those cities. I think when it comes to our living in the earthly city with those who are not of our faith or who have no faith, we still share a common goods of a human flourishing. And I think we need a thicker account of those goods. And here I would draw upon the Catholic thinker, uh, um, Alistair McIntyre, who says, here, here's what is eudaimon, eudaimonia. Here's what is an account of human flourishing. What can we agree upon in terms of ethics? Good health a standard of living free from destitution, food, clothing, shelter, good family relationships, sufficient education that allows everyone to develop his or her powers, productive and rewarding work, good friends, leisure activities, and the ability of a rational agent to order one's life and to identify and learn from one's mistakes. So that's sort of the best we can do, if you will, in the earthly city for human flourishing, and we all have a stake in that. At the same time, that's not sufficient for people of faith. We need something more. And what we need that is more is to recognize that, that that can lead to this kind of imminent, exclusive humanism. So we need a people who will also affirm these goods and affirm that they lead us to human flourishing and at the same time recognize the more, what the Jesuits call the magis, the 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 reference of the, to the fullness, the transcendence, not in, a, not in an attempt to impose and dominate those who don't share our faith, which is one of the ways some people try to respond to the secular, is to, get, to take over the power of the government and impose the, a more theological account of the good on everyone. Not through that, but through the importance of witness, witness through structures of charity, which show that even that there's even a better way yet than this account of human flourishing. And I think that's the role of religious communities within at least the Western secular as a way to move forward. So um, I have much more I would love to discuss, uh, but hopefully that'll at least generate some questions. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh Professor uh, Long for this in-depth in -depth presentation and uh, I like the idea of creating the conversation because that's we are here to create conversation and to create the purpose of learning about ethics and uh, applying ethics itself. Uh, perhaps I know the time, uh, the time is not uh, perhaps uh, enough for you to address the issue of the challenges but we will have you know 
uh, ample time later on in the discussion so that you can also uh, add something with regards to the uh, challenges ahead. Before I move, to, uh, I move on to our second speaker, I would like to apologize for one thing because we advertise that uh, Dr. Abdul Majid Sghayir will be with us tonight from Morocco. He's a philosopher and thinker, but unfortunately, due, due to his uh, health circumstances, he was not able to make it uh, from the beginning of this uh, uh, three-day seminar, but he will join us tomorrow. He will arrive tonight late at night, and he will join us tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> to compensate and uh, for the sake of uh, you know uh, our friends who are here, uh, perhaps to follow and listen to Dr. Abdel Majid Sahir, it's an open uh, invitation to you to come tomorrow to attend. Inshallah, he will be there and he will deliver two lectures. So we are uh, very sorry for that. And uh, please, if you are really interested to listen to Dr. Abdel Majid Sahir, please uh, turn up tomorrow uh, morning from nine o'clock and we will finish at three o'clock. We will have uh, breaks, uh, morning break and also lunch and prayer break. So, and you will uh, for sure enjoy the talk and also the uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Abdul Majid uh, with the, uh, and the chair of the session will be Professor uh, De Dean Muhammad, inshallah. So let me now, with your permission, quickly move on to our second speaker. She is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Michaela Nullinger. Uh, she studied Catholic. Uh, she studied uh, Catholic theology and Islamic studies in Vienna, uh, Salzburg, uh, Jerusalem, and Birmingham. Uh, she is focusing on interreligious relations, political philosophy, and the future of the reli of religion in secular frame. Uh, since 2013, uh, Dr. Nollinger. Uh, he, he is a researcher at the Department for Systematic, uh, Systematic uh, Theology at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. Uh, besides her research, she is also teaching religious studies, history of religion, and introduction to theology. She has uh, numerous publications. If you are interested to follow up her research and publications. We have the website. She got a website. I'm sorry, I can't list them all, but we will provide you with the website, and perhaps she uh, will, uh, you know, cite some of them during her, uh, you know, presentation. So, Dr. Uh, Michaela, please, the microphone is yours. So, thank you very much for um, the invitation tonight and the possibility to speak to you and many things that can and should be said about the secular have already been mentioned by Steve Long, so actually I could stop here <laughs> and we could uh, start with the discussion. Um, but um, maybe I can give you some, um, some insights into the context I'm living in and I'm teaching and researching in. Um, so I would like to start um, with an example and with the context where I come from and the challenges we are facing there. So Austria is really a small country <laughs> and uh, very much shaped by the Catholic Church, although times are changing. And when we are moving back in the 1930s probably, so you've got this nice picture of a farmer's family in Austria. I grew up on the countryside. Um, maybe 800 inhabitants at that time and 800 Catholics, of course and you would have some small farms. And each February, the farm laborers would be allowed to switch their landlord. But would they also get their wa wages, the money they would earn throughout the year? Only if they were able to show evidence of their annual confession in the church. So no money without a pure soul. And without being Catholic and following the strict moral co codex of the pre-Vatican II Catholic Church, you, you would be a total social outsider. And in case of the farm laborers, you would not even receive your wages. You follow the religious moral codex because you have to, due to the social, political and economic pressure. But not because you are convinced. Maybe you are convinced, but um, that's not that important. The priest has spoken and the ordinary man has to follow. So it's actually a morality of power, of coercive power. And now let's move 
some 80, 80 years later, 2018. And one of the tasks I give my first year students is, let's think about two or maybe three theologians whom you consider to be influential for contemporary public debates, maybe ethical debates. And guess what the answer is? No, none. <laughs> there are no answer at all. <laughs> Maybe it's the weakness of Austrian theologians that they are not that important and intelligent as they should be. <laughs> Maybe it's the speechlessness of my first year students being afraid of the first year at university. But I think it's also an important sign of the times. And it seems as if theologians, at least in Austria and its surroundings, do not really have a say anymore in public debates more specific specifically in ethical debates. While 80 years ago the Catholic Church ruled the ethical debates with rarely any resistance, today's church mainly appears in the media when there is another sexual abuse scandal, <coughs> anti-abortion demonstration by radical life groups, not by, you know, some, um, you would say, people who argue, but really radical people. But are theologians and theological ethicists of any relevance for political and scientific arguments about central problems of contemporary life. If I follow my students' answers, no. But why should these theologians make their contribution anyway and how? Aren't we better off with purely secular ethics? To keep it in a, put it in a nutshell, aren't we just good enough without God? I will not go into many details of the different ideas of what the secular is um, because we've got already heard um, quite a lot of these important insights from um, Professor Long. I will just point to some um, differentiations some of you heard in the morning already. Um, but these differentiations are important, especially for the context I come from, because we do not only speak about secularization, but about two secularizations in them. So secularization and secularisierung. The first being this dismissal from religious rule in Catholic canon law. So um, you secularize, for example, a church or a specific instrument you use for liturgical purposes, and afterwards it's not a church anymore, but a completely building, like all the other houses in the village, for example. And the second important process is the so-called Reichsdeputationshauptschluss of 1803, when many belongings, main, main, many areas that formerly belonged to the Catholic Church in, um, on the left side of the Rhine River were, um, were given to German nobles because they wanted to be, um, their former properties were taken away by the French state and by Napoleon and they asked for compensation. And what the Germans did, what the German state did was take away the belongings of the Catholic Church and give them to the German nobles. And that was a kind of hu humiliation, of course, for the church. And on the other hand, um, it was a kind of lib liberation as well to refocus the own mission and to rethink the own position in this world. And the second idea we've got already heard about um, quite a lot, secularization in the sense of a theological and philosophical category, um, a way of interpreting um, the processes, especially in the 19th, 18th century, um, and um, how to describe and understand them. Theologically speaking, um, the church and theology and the theology have always struggled with both the terms secularization and the respective um, historical and political developments that are associated with the, these secularizations. And you surely know this famous differentiation of Casanova, the privatization of religion, the decline of religion, and the separation of the spheres. And um, differentiation of the state and the religious institutions to be the valid core of the secularization thesis. And this is something which is very important for me. The problem is just when this idea of 
secularization becomes is not only a descriptive term anymore for certain developments in a historical in in the historical sense but if it becomes highly normative and um, becomes associated with processes of power of imposing specific structures and imposing a certain way of thinking and this is particularly true when we've got um, when we have a look at the different historical, social and political contexts of authors and their specific intentions. It becomes even more complicated when we speak about secularism. And my experience is that um, when you live in an English-speaking environment, secularism is used for many different ideas and many different programs, let's call it programs. But historically speaking, it was associated with a specific group of people. It was the so-called secular society founded by Jacob Holyoke in 1846, um, which then 20 years later became a very aggressive anti-religious movement. And um, in this context, secularism, now I'm speaking about the word secularism, also became a severe anti-modernist battle term, especially used by, um, by different Christian groups and also by the Catholic Church. It signified, for example, at the mission conference in Jerusalem 1928, the de-Christianization of humanity, something that had to be fought against. And it was not only used by this um, secular society or the mission conference and many actors in the Catholic Church, but it was also used by um, fascist group, national socialist act activists in the 1920s and 1930s to delegitimize um, democracy. So you have to be very careful when you refer to secularism, and especially in, in the German-speaking world, we rarely use the term secularism anymore, because it's so much associated with this old ideological battle against religion and at the same time against democracy. But at the same time, secularism reappears through the translations, for example, of the work by Charles Taylor and others. But what Charles Taylor and these people are talking about is not this old ideological battle term, but, um, yeah, but a very open program, actually. But these um, complex um, social, um, social contexts and backgrounds <coughs> make um, a sincere debate very difficult, um, both uh, in the public arena and then specifically in the field of um, secular and religious ethics, ethics. As we've already heard about Charles Taylor before, I would immediately like to move on with the question of challenges of contemporary ethics. And I would say there are particularly three challenges we are faced with in the field of ethics. The first challenge, I would say, is ethical pluralism. I can't, uh, consciously call it a challenge, not a danger, per se. Contesting ethics and moralities are available in the globalized world, and they are an actual possibility. And this ethical pluralism is actually a double plural. So on the one hand, you've got a plural of religious ethics that are available to people. Christian ethics, Muslim ethics, Jewish ethics, Hindu ethics, all kinds of possibilities. And you've got a plural of secular alternatives, secular ethics. So being a Christian, Muslim, Jewish ethicist, you need to have arguments with many different religious and <coughs> secular alternative, alternatives to the ethics you stand up for. And especially with regard to secular alternatives, the religious ethicist needs to answer the question, are you really a better person following religious ethics? Does it make a difference to, to, to do theological ethics or secular ethics when the result is probably the same? And in the words of Stanley Howe, was one of the famous ethicists who really say there is a difference, he would say, what if what is said theologically only affirms what we know from other sources? or is possibly even better formulated in a non-theological language. Why should 
why should we do any theological ethics then? Why then? The second challenge is um, the possibility of rational arguments in ethical debates. Are we really able to have rational arguments anymore? Ethical reflection is always embedded in concrete historical and social contexts. And this requires permanent discussion and dialogue between the different actors of a society. And confronted with growing religious and secular pluralism, the requested honest and authentic dialogue becomes highly challenging. So Jürgen Habermas and Karl Otto Appel um, in their idea of discourse ethics are convinced that there is the possibility for coming to an agreement in ethical disputes if the conflict partners are able to debate non-violently and have the same opportunities in the debate. So if there is equality for the partners. But this ideal discourse requires the participants to accept each other's freedom and ability to rational reasoning. And I really wonder if this ideal discourse is actually possible. Postmodern authors moreover doubt that human reasoning is that, is that reliable and trustworthy. How can those who doubt human rational reasoning and those who strongly believe in its power, in the power of reason, then come together in an ideal discourse, if you do not even agree on reason. And finally, what is probably the most um, difficult challenge and most overlooked challenge, I would say, and you've already pointed to that, um, who is actually the human being? What is human dignity and what is the good? Probably the deepest crisis of contemporary ethics is connected to its intrinsic task of protecting life and human dignity. What is actually the human being? And what are the conditions of life that foster the prospering, the flourishing of humanity and human dignity? Especially biotechnology questions the self-understanding of the human being. Where are the limits between therapy and enhancement? Why should it be forbidden to eliminate certain genes from organisms? And what is the difference between eliminating Korea Huntington, genetic deafness, and probably brown hair? Who cares? And who sets the criteria for being truly human? What seemed to be so clear after World War II that this horror must not happen again, that we must protect human dignity and human rights? now becomes disputed again, and disputed from very different angles. As I'm teaching and trained as a Catholic theologian, I would like to make a few comments on religious ethics in the post-secular, yeah, yeah, that's good, <laughs> um, from a Catholic perspective. For Catholic theologians, the Second Vatican Council essentially changed the Church's relation to the world. And it's particularly three decisions that were taken at the Council, the highest teaching authority of the Church, that are important for relocating religious ethics in a secular world. And these three, three are mentioned on the presentation. So it's first of all that the Council recognized the, rel the relative and legitimate autonomy of the world the autonomy of earthly affairs and especially of sciences. And this autonomy of the world is theologically just justified as the will of the creator, as it is mentioned in Gaudium et Space, the respective document, number 36. The Council recognizes the freedom of conscience it accepts the freedom of the human conscience, and this conscience is, is the core of the human being, according to the Council. In acting freely according to his conscience, the human being fulfills its dignity. And that's one of the debates we had this morning between authority and human conscience. What is more important? And finally, recognizing the freedom of religion, which is closely connected to this recognition of the freedom of conscience. In its declaration, Dignitatis Humani, the dignity of the human being, the Catholic Church 
fully accepts the freedom of religion, despite centuries of neglecting and even condemning this freedom. The Council says that there is one truth, but this truth attracts the human being. It is communicable and rationali rationally recognizable. And I'll give you one short quotation from this declaration. The truth cannot impose itself except by the virtue of its own truth, as it makes its entrance into the mind at once quietly and with power. Religious freedom in turn, which man demands as necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God, has to do with immunity from coercion, coercion in civil society. These three decisions of the Council are crucial for understanding the self relocation of Catholic theological ethics in public political debates today. And how you can actually do that, I would like to finally give you two minutes. Two, minutes. <laughs> two examples for two minutes. Perfect. <laughs> So the church accepted, and that was really and still is a high, really challenging for some parts of the Catholic Church, that it's not the duty and not the task of the church to be actively involved in party politics, to be actively involved in any kind of political institutions of the state, but that the first place of the debates and of ethical debates where the church is involved is civil society. And these debates have to follow rational standards. They need to, ha need to be based on intellectual integrity. So you have to openly say where you come from, what is your background, your intellectual background. And the third point is epistemic humility. That you're all on a way towards recognizing what is good for the human being. And to give two practical examples, I would like to refer to the Austrian Catholic Social Academy. Um, this academy was founded by the Austrian Conference of Bishops and is officially recognized by the Austrian state as a legal person. Its aim is to foster the implementation of Catholic social teaching in Austria via research, educational work, discussion events and lobbying. And their staff does not only lobbying work in, politi in politics, but it advises also enterprises how to work responsibly in our world today. And it regularly comments on the Austrian political and economic situation and tries to bring together political, religious and civic actors. And that's some of the activities they're doing. So having alternative um, economics and um, yeah, giving public lectures, what does it mean to be a Christian in this society today? And probably one of the most important fields where religious actors today are active in um, giving advice um, are ethics committees. That's the National Eth Bioethic Committee, um, which is a kind of half institutionalized participation, I would say, because the ethics committee is actually installed by the government, but it does not have any governmental power. So theologians of different denominations work together with physicians, lawyers, philosophers and advise the government, especially in the field of bioethics. So with these two examples, I would like to stop my reflections and yeah, <laughs> uh, Thank you very much, uh, Michaela, for uh, being uh, committed to the time exactly is 20 minutes. That's uh, great. In terms of substance, I like the methodology of, uh, the great methodology actually, or taking the challenge of, you know, integrating theology, anthropology, sociology, philosophy, political science, all together to address the issue of, you know, the secularism, ethics, and also the uh, challenges uh, ahead. That's number one. Number two, uh, I'm a bit biased here, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, also, I like the idea of relocating ethics in the modern, uh, religious ethics in the modern uh, era, and also, you know, uh, paying 
lots of attention to the issue of you know the rational argument behind behind any uh, you know ethical position that we take it's great and uh, without further ado i would like to now uh, introduce our third speaker uh, dr uh, edward muad uh, he is an associate professor of philosophy uh, in the Department of Humanities uh, in Qatar University. Uh, he earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Missouri, uh, Columbia in 2004. His research areas uh, cover uh, Islamic uh, philosophy, uh, metaphysics, uh, philosophy of religion, and uh, co comparative moral uh, epistemology. And he has appeared in several uh, academic journals, including Philosophical Quarterly, uh, Philosophy East and West, International Journal uh, for Philosophy of Religion, uh, Sophia, and Philosophy and Theology, among many others. Uh, Edward Muad, please, the microphone is yours. So 20 minutes, please, and thank you. Yes, uh, I will just share some thoughts about secular and religious ethics, which uh, a little bit from the top of my head within the last two days. Um, nothing is as is, is well documented as my colleagues here. Um, I asked myself what would I want to say or what could I say about this that people don't already know. Probably nothing. But what I did do is bring some things that I discussed in some of my classes at which I thought would be relevant to connect together for this um, with along with some other things. So these are the three things I will talk about. The first, I think that the secular and religious is a pernicious distinction. I don't think that it's, that we can give a coherent, clear meaning to these terms, and I think that, that our, our use of these terms damages the discourse a lot and, and damages us in many ways, and I'd really like rather do away with the distinction or try to trace what we intend to mean by these words to something real. I want to look at some Eastern philosophers, some Far Eastern philosophers, uh, Keiji Nishitani, who's a Japanese philosopher, and Confucius on two different topics. Uh, and I think that can be helpful because a lot of the time our discourse about secularism and religion and the secular and the religious incurs in this very intense sort of conversation you might call it a relationship or sort of love-hate relationship or dysfunctional marriage that's been going on since the last thousand years between Islam and, and, and Christianity or Islam and the West, right? And, and, and a lot of times the reasons that these concepts and words have no meaning and is because they're used in a political kind of chess game that goes on all the time in different ways, right? So it can be refreshing for us to look elsewhere sometimes instead of at each other. In, in, in order to get some different ideas, you know. And that's why I find it sometimes useful to look at Far Eastern philosophy in, in, this, in this case. Um, so why do I think, well, I mean, there are so many reasons, and everybody ha is familiar, I think, with the many reasons that many different uh, thinkers have given why the distinction between the secular and the religious is um, obscure and harmful, right? Um, in the Arab and Muslim world today, right now, I think the distinction usually mainly is used to shield abusive regimes from moral accountability. I think this happens, and we know how this happens, right? If, if, if the people resist or object or speak out against abuses of the regime on the basis of the moral language which is native to them, Islam, then the regime will, in the name of secularism, strike them down as Islamic extremists, right, in the defense of secularism, yeah? On the other hand, if the people come and they object to the abuses of the regime on the basis of quote-unquote universal human rights or liberal human rights, uh, then the regime will declare that they are imposing Western values on, right, uh, non-West, this, this, on, on them, yeah? And they'll strike them down as alien in that case. So. What happens is that in all different angles from which a person might summon the moral authority to speak the truth in the face of the tyrant, which is the best jihad according to the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu right? He is, uh, the people are disempowered, right? And in the end, the, we have uh, the, the regime uh, totally immune from any kind of moral accountability 
on, on whatever possible basis that we could, uh, you know, uh, hold them accountable. And that's the problem. That's the way it's used. I thought if I wanted to use sort of an imagery, we could call it bone socracy, and we could just use the metaphor of taking a bone saw, cutting a person right down the middle in half with it, calling one half secular and the other half religious, and using the one half to beat the other half into submission. That's kind of how I feel about it, and I don't. So I'm, I'm against these terms, in, in, and they're used in a really bad way in our context. Historically, they were used to manage colonialism, right? So the secular was the, the, the viewpoints of the morals or the, 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 the code of the colonizer and the religious was always something particular and specific and therefore that was just the justification for, you know, uh, sub, sub, subordinating, you know, the, the colonized, right? And the West, we've already, I mean, our, our colleagues have already said many things about, uh, you know, how this distinction has been used. Um, Dr. Michaela said a lot about how it had been used to serve many different agendas and, and, and understood in many different ways. Um, I think among religious people in general, uh, as well as in the West, right, uh, we use this sometimes to distinguish what we think of as the universal or the rational from what we think of as merely specific or cultural or arbitrary, right? Um, and also, we also, among religious people, use it to distinguish what we take to be permanent from uh, what's malleable or contextual, right? So Muslims, we, we're in the habit of, we, we like to distinguish what we think of as purely Islamic from what we think of as merely cultural, right? And we think that we've easily made a distinction, but I think oftentimes it's not the case, right? We're trying to look for something which we think can be counted on to not change amidst, uh, you know, contexts and... and, and uh, the world around us, which is which is changing, and we want to be able to differentiate between those two. And sometimes, basically, we use the terms uh, to shortcut. It's an intellectual shortcut. And in general, not with only these terms, secular and religious, but many terms. My advice to any intellectual, any person, is that we should be aware of terms that we have a habit of using easily and often to categorize things when we cannot define those terms in a coherent and a non-circular way. So we should always check and ask ourselves what these terms mean, and if we can't actually give ourselves a clear, coherent, and non-circular definition. I mean, for example, when, when someone asks, what is religious, we, do, we don't say, oh, it's the not secular. Or secular is not religious, something like this, right? We need to actually interrogate the terms that we use, and if we don't, you know, usually, not always, but in many cases, if we can't define it in this way, we should be very beware of these terms and what we're doing when you use them. So after that, I'm going to tell you <laughs> a definition of religion, <laughs> which I just told you we can't. <laughs> well, this Keiji Nishitani is a Japanese philosopher. I sometimes use him in my introduction to philosophy class. Um, he wrote a book called Religion and Nothingness. So he has an interesting... Uh, idea about how we might define religion. He's a Buddhist and he tries to incorporate some of existential philosophy into Buddhism. B despite the fact that that's the case, I find that what he's saying very compelling to me, and I'm not a Buddhist, right? Um, I think maybe anybody would find it uh, fairly compelling. So here's the passage, and then I'll explain a little bit what he means, right? He's asking what religion is. He says, we put ourselves as individuals slash man slash mankind at the center and weigh the significance of everything as the contents of our lives as individuals slash man slash mankind. <coughs> but religion upsets the posture from which we think of ourselves as telos and center of all things. Instead, religion poses as a starting point to question for what purpose do I exist? So in this bit, Nishitani actually starts by, by asking the question, what is religion, and, and, and talking about how people ask, what is religion good for? And he basically tells us that when you ask the question, what is religion for, and people start giving answers like, religion is good for, you know, it, it helps to have a healthy society or to keep public order or, you know, it, it, it you know, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, or whatever it is that you want to say that religion does, you know, for. He says you're missing the point. You're really talking about religion yet. 
Because when we when we talk about religion in that way, we talk about it in the way we talk about everything else. Like, what's that bottle for? Well, it's for holding water so that when I'm thirsty, I can drink. What's this laptop for? It's for doing things that I need to do to serve my purposes, use the PowerPoint you know, presentation and so forth. We normally right, consider and give meaning to things in the world on the basis of what purpose they serve for us. And we are the center in that case, not as only as individuals, but obviously as man and slash mankind, if I want to talk about what it does for the human race or for my community or whatever. I or we is always uh, the sort of center point, right? The purpose of everything else, the, re the, the, the reason or the meaning by which we give, uh, we interpret uh, what everything else is for in the world, right? And he says, w you're not in the religious state of mind when you think in that way, so when you talk about religion that way, you're not really talking about religion. He wants to tell us that religion is actually not just a set of practices or trying to figure out, you know, like a set of, find some kind of set of practices that different people do in the world that we can say oh, all, all the practices and beliefs or, and et cetera which, which, which fit this description are, are religious. Because those things can be what we might call secular, depending on where we place the center of meaning, right? He thinks that a person actually gets into a religious state of mind only at the point when they begin to question their own existence. When you ask yourself what you are for, and suddenly you are not sufficient and adequate anymore to be the thing which gives meaning and, and, and purpose to everything else, right? Everything enters a state uh, which he calls nullity. You know? He gets this from existentialists, right? This sense of, sense of meaninglessness or non-existence or the negation of, of, of any of, of meaning or, or being, right? And when a person enters that state of mind, right, only then are they capable of now becoming a, me you know, a means of something else, finding the center of purpose outside themselves. And then they become, they have to ask themselves, what purpose do I exist for instead of what can this do for me? And they ask, what's the point of my existence, right? And then that, that's when the sort of religious quest begins, as, as Nishitani calls it, right? So what does all this have to do with um, how we might give some kind of meaning to the distinction between the religion and the religion and, and, and the secular. It seems to me if I were to adopt at least a point of view based on my understanding of, of, of Nishitani, it, it would seem to follow that nothing itself is really secular or religious. We couldn't call an ethic either secular or religious in itself or a law secular religious in itself or even a mosque or a McDonald's secular religious in itself, right? It rather has to do with the way I am being toward the world. So this is kind of a Heideggerian term. It has to do with how sort of the world is when you're in, let's say, a sort of a state of consciousness toward things, yeah? Here, distinguish between these two states of, 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 of awareness. I'm aware of things only in terms of as they serve a purpose for me or suddenly I become aware of things where I'm not the center anymore and, I'm, and, I, and my own purpose is placed in, in, under question, yeah? And it's not clear. So in that case, well, we have two here, as I say. When, one, where I think of things in relation to myself or ourselves, even if I'm talking about humanity as a whole, as its ultimate purpose, as the ultimate purpose of everything. If something has a purpose, it has to have something to do with what it does for us me and you and, and human beings, right? And a second way of being toward things in which I'm being toward them in relation, in, in relation to something beyond myself or ourselves as the ultimate purpose. And it's not true that whatever we call religious or what we're in the habit of calling religious on the basis of the surface, distinct, uh, the way things appear, is actually religious in the real sense then. Neither is it the case that everything that we call secular on the basis of the things that we're in the habit of calling them secular for, are actually secular in reality, in this sense. Rather, it seems to me that everything could be religious or secular, depending on how I'm being toward it. So that if I'm a person's in a, a sort of now a state where, right, there your own purpose and your own meaning is in question, and and this. And, and you're actually realizing that you need something beyond yourself to give yourself meaning. That will follow for everything else as well. So if I question 
and then affirm the meaning of my existence. Because if I question the meaning of my existence, I don't necessarily affirm it. I could become a nihilist. I could decide that nothing has any meaning, right? But Nishitani is a Buddhist, right? They have an interesting thing where you meditate and you come to a sort of state of enlightenment and then achieve a kind of nirvana eventually, right? Which it does involve questioning the meaning of your own existence and decentering yourself. And sometimes it seems nihilist, but then they have this idea of a bodhisattva who comes back from that state to back to the earth to help other people out of a sense of compassion for humankind, right? And if and it seems like if, if I affirm the meaning of my existence after questioning it, right? You realize you don't really anything in yourself or like as Ibn Sina said, you know, if you consider anything in itself, it's nothingness. It's by itself, does non-existent. Only in relation to God, it can have existence, right? You consider your yourself, in, in, you know, in, in yourself. You, if you realize that you're nothing by yourself, right? And everything else that is something because of its relation to you will also become nothing, right? But if uh, you find that God give yourself back to you, right? God, uh, you realize I exist for a God, that, a purpose that God has, and then you affirm yourself in that case but not because of yourself, but through something else. Everything else that is necessary and important for you in your life that God has now affirmed also becomes affirmed through God, right? So if we're social creatures and we right, require you know, a, a, a community to exist, then we, have to, we will also affirm the community. We also affirm the conditions under which a healthy community uh, is, is, is possible. But being secular, so being religious, or, you know, can sacralize all that, right? Whereas, if I'm being secular, I'll s I, I can secularize everything. The mosque and the religion, all that can become secular if the purpose is, if, if I understand it in terms of a purpose which it serves for me or for us, however I conceive me or us. And I think that's why Tasawwuf developed early in Muslim history, because it got secularized real fast. And the whole idea of the Sawaf is just that other state of mind where it's not secularized, right? The purpose is not found here in me or in some group that I identify with, right? But still, it's the purpose is outside of ourselves. I, mean, I, I have five minutes, so I'll talk about Confucius a bit. Now, that brings us to the community, and that's why I think Confucius ethics is interesting and in, 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 in important and fruitful for us to study actually because he says a lot about and he has a lot to teach about the relation between the individual and the community and community virtue individual virtue and community virtue and the conditions for that right yeah and i think that it, it actually can help muslims understand islam better i think uh, because it is the case we understand ourselves a lot of times our, under our self-understanding is heavily influenced by the by, by the kind of discourse and the, and the relations we have with others. And we're having this really intense relationship with the West, yeah? However we conceive of the West or however the West conceives of itself. And also they. They understand themselves in distinction to us and we understand ourselves in distinction to them. And I think this is warps and twists the understanding that we have of each other and ourselves in both cases. So for everybody, involved, I think it's helpful to look somewhere else, and Confucius has a lot to talk about, especially with this tense relation, the tense issue here about the relation between the individual and the community. Um, one of the things that Confucius wants to do, he says it's important that we put words in the right places. And it's also, it, it's, it's, it's important here to realize, to remember Confucius is living in a time in, in the Chinese history called the Warring States period, right, where, where China was busted up into small different states, all of them fighting each other in a constant state of warfare, which to me is very much like what we have here in the Middle East now, right? Among, in the Muslim world, we are in a warring states period, in fact, right? And the problem with that is that propaganda ensues everywhere. People start lying all the time, because right in war, the first victim is truth. And Confucius said, the, what we have to do to reform society is put words in their proper places. We have to use words correctly instead of using them incorrectly. So an example of what he means is what we can see today. I got this from a book about Confucianism that talked about Confucianism in the modern world. There's a nuclear missile called Peacekeeper. That's a problem. That's not using words in the right way. 
If we get a nuclear missile and we call it peacekeeper, we're not going to do very well, you know? It's not going to happen. Another example, an interesting example that comes from Mencius, they came to Mencius in the presence of, 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 uh, of, of, the, of one of the kings, I can't remember his name. They said, you know, Mencius uh, in the history tells us that the Chao dynasty took over from the previous king who was a tyrant and killed him. Is it right to kill a king? And Mencius said, I read that book. I never read in there that a king was killed. I only read that a criminal was killed, right? This is about, again, putting words in their proper places, yeah? And this also, this problem also applies to the secular and the religious. The last thing I want to talk about is this concept, which I think could be useful for us. Ren and Li. Ren is like humanity, right? Um, the idea, uh, the, the main idea for Confucius is to become a virtuous person, which is to sort of exemplify humanity, right? But this can only be done with, through Li. Lee is translated as ritual, but it's kind of more interesting, I think, or maybe uh, f helpful to translate or think of it as language. Because Rin is a universal value. We're all human, right? But the thing and the reason why Confucius thinks of Li as very important, he, he, part of getting words right and relationships right in society, is uh, also sort of getting rituals right. He, he was interested in everybody practicing and and, and abiding by certain kind of rituals. And the reason for this is because you can only express uh, and manifest humanity, which is universal, in a kind of a specific medium of communication, in a kind of a specific language, so to speak, right? And that has to be shared, yeah? And I think a lot of times, a lot of the, uh, the problems that we have now is, is this. In the West, we also have uh, uh, any cosmopolitan society, right? We have a, it happens kind of a crisis of Li. We all seem to share some values, but we don't know how to express it, right? Um, that could be a, a problem, or we could at least, I think, use these concepts to maybe diagnose some of the phenomena that happen, right? Yeah, uh, some examples I have in mind, but I have, yeah, I think I have less than two minutes, yeah? He's being polite for me. <laughs> and they're just examples, so I could stop now. Yes, uh, Dr. Muad, uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, the things that I would like to take from uh, your uh, in-depth uh, presentation are two things. One is the orientation towards the East, and this is something very interesting to consider and always to refer to. I know many, uh, uh, like for example, uh, Mahathir bin Mohammed, the, uh, pr uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, before, he used always to call people to look uh, East, not always to be oriented to the West, and you'll find wisdom there. And uh, of course, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Mu Muadh, he tried to uh, bring to us uh, the experience of, of uh, Keiji uh, Nishitani. Nishitani and his, um, uh, his contribution in terms of understanding what is religion specifically. And also the Confucius uh, tradition or religion, it's, it's very important to understand the values uh, there. And I like the way that you, uh, you have some sort of uh, self-criticism, and that's also uh, very important for you know, growing and uh, being also uh, always you know, uh, humble to accept you know, ideas and other uh, you know, uh, approaches. With this, I would like now to open the floor for uh, question and answer, but I would like to follow uh, just uh, a methodology to facilitate this, because we have uh, about, uh, we can say, more than half an hour, uh, 45 minutes, up to 45 minutes. And I would like to engage everyone, and I would like you to feel free to ask questions and also to comment. But please uh, be brief and uh, direct so the questions are directed to perhaps one of the speakers or all of them. And also the comments, you, you are free to comment on whatever they have said or to add something. Uh, but also please uh, observe that there are others also would like to participate, so be, be, be brief and direct. So we will take first round and then it goes like that. So we'll have questions. So please, those who are uh, 
uh, would like to ask questions or comments so please uh, we will have here one there uh, yes please enter just introduce yourself briefly and uh, go ahead just my name Bilal um, I, I excuse me I'm, I'm a peasant here I just want to to ask uh, a question um, I felt that much of the discussion or debate is like old like it's not relevant anymore sorry I'm, I'm, I'm just expressing my my feeling and if you look at the world now you find that there is this populism you know who are coming back and it's a completely different world we're living in now when people talk about modernity you know this is like dead you know <laughs> sorry I'm so I would like to hear something more contemporary or more relevant um, about the topic. The other, this is my question. The other thing, the other point is, is a comment and, and also, if possible, a question. Um, I think, I think there, is, there may be, this is my personal view, a misunderstanding of the Islamic view of the world, if you like. I think because Islam does not have a church, there is a problem in understanding the word secularism. It's, it's, it's problematic, you know. We, originally in Islam, there is not supposed to be any um, clergy. It is against Islam to have clergy. And yet, after the Prophet's time, we had fuqaha, you know, the scholars. And these uh, changed role, apparently, at some point, from being um, the, s the equivalent of discipline masters, you know, like uh, university professors, into a more church-like, you know, clergy-like role. And, and that is creating a lot of confusion. So for us, you see, when people, there is, there is this thing about Islam, which is democratization of religion that every Muslim has to read the source of Islam, which is the Quran. He cannot, he, he is not supposed to take the authority of anyone to accept the authority of any intermediary. He is not supposed to do that. And the Quran is full of rational arguments and it's full of reference to the world, to the signs of God. And if you look at the signs of God in the Quran, it's all secular, you know, sorry, I mean, it's like the two together, brings the, the two together. It's saying that, you know, this thing, this natural phenomenon is a sign of God. And, and it's a natural phenomenon, you know, it's a physical, and it's a sign of God. And, and people from the Muslim, th this is another uh, source of confusion when we talk about secularism. So the only relevant secularism, religious, relevant, for people like me, was the issue of democracy and, and legal aspects, you know? And, and I think that is the area where, in a Muslim context, effort needs to focus. Because the other one about the world and so on is not relevant. And the other one is actually what created something like the French attitude towards religion, if I, if I may call it that, rather than using other terms. But in, in, in this part of the world, this has impacted people and labeled secularism as, I like the word separationism in the States, and it's relevant to the topic of the discussion and, and things like that. Can, can, can people sort of like, because I'm, I'm speaking from, an un, I'm not a specialist in, in the <coughs> domain, and I'm sort of like expressing it as a peasant. So I would like to hear from the scholars their, you know, some learned insights into, into these uh, uh, comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bilal, for uh, your question and comments. Uh, please switch, on the, uh, switch off the oh, microphone. Sorry. Now, uh, Tamim, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a credit to each of you that there was very little overlap, I think, between each talk. 
I have a very brief question. Something came to mind with Dr. Michaela mentioning um, the difference between therapy and enhancement. Uh, what What do you guys think, or, or what, is he, what does each of you think of the case of Iceland eradicating uh, Down syndrome? Is that something that we should be celebrating, or is that something that we should be despairing about? Thank you. Is there any other question here? So that we, or we. Um, thank you so much for uh, all your presentations. Uh, um, I, I, it's, it's really useful because, like, it gets uh, various uh, and different uh, views. Um, I have uh, one question, and I am um, like, it is for this for the three speakers. Uh, when we, uh, when uh, Professor Long talked about um, that um, there are ideas, the theologi theological ideas were flattened and then they are uh, reused by the secular. So, so re with reference um, to this idea, to what extent do you think the ideals uh, of um, human rights, you know, liberty, freedom, uh, justice, have been f flattened or used in the same manner? And, and, and the same thing, um, these ideas, these same ideas. Um, Michaela you talked about what is the good, and then she referred to the three, you know, epistemic humility, rationality, and uh, intellectual. So to what extent also these ideals of uh, human rights and liberty and freedom and justice can be related to what is the good when they are defined by these three? And again, to Professor, um, Edwards, uh, again, you talk about uh, uh, this, the, um, uh, uh, the being beyond the self in, in relation to uh, 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 um, uh, the, the divine. So where do you find these concepts? How can you define these concepts? And also in relation to the um, shared universal values, how can you define these ideas of human rights. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, get uh, re some responses from uh, our distinguished uh, speakers. I think I would uh, suggest that uh, we start with Michaela first because uh, there is a direct question with regard to the Down syndrome in Iceland. And then the other questions are for all uh, panels, please. I have to admit, I'm not totally informed of the activities in Iceland, but I think it's, um, there's, yeah. Oh, boy. oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's not only a phenomenon then in Iceland, but in many, many, many countries. I, I just think that's highly problematic, really, because um, there are. Um, who decides that Down syndrome is really an illness, and it is really pain and suffering? I do have. I. In my family, we do have one um, now adult who who has Down syndrome, and you would hardly recognize that she has the Down syndrome, really. She has a driving license, she's working, and now she, I think she's 25, and if she was born today, she w I, I mean, she would not have been, she wouldn't be born today, because someone has decided that this is an illness. And I, thi and, and I think that's only the, um, well, I think Down syndrome and avoiding children, having Down syndrome, is only the top of the iceberg. And I think I'm afraid that things will get even worse. I mean, who decides that um, there, there are, for example, um, cases of, uh, of deafness that are genetic. Who decides that, um, that this deafness is an illness for this person and that this person should not be born? And um, I think that's things we really have to have to address. And um, and what else? Yeah, and that's also connected to to the question of language um, and the question of framing and um, how we talk about how we talk about in this case ethical issues. Um, a few months ago, I gave a workshop at um, um, for pastoral workers who are working in hospitals. And um, and we were talking about um, not only abortion but about um, women suffering from um, how to say um, 
they lose their children at a very early stage. And, um, and the people in the hospital, they would tell, say, well, that's not a child, that's just themselves. What do you care about? And um, also in the respective ethical debates, you don't talk about children or life or etc. Many people now start talking about cells. And that's changing our debates radically. And therefore, I'm very thankful, um, Dr. Muad, um, that you mentioned Confucius and the importance of using the right words in the right places. I, I agree with um, what my colleague said about the unwillingness of some societies to receive Down syndrome children. Um, um, I'm part of a cycling club in Wisconsin, and two of my good friends have received, they're both Roman Catholic, and they think this is an important part of their vocation. And what troubles me about this is that there's no evidence that the Down syndrome children are in any sense unhappy. So it really has to do with sort of our projection as opposed to to, to recognizing the fullness of, of what it means to be human. So I find that deeply troubling and worry like you about uh, forms of enhancement. There's a book called Better Than Well by a student of Charles Taylor, and he argues that since we've lost uh, the notion of a spiritual journey, what we have now is this medicalization of a religious quest where our task is always to make ourselves better than well through, you know, through all kinds of uh, enhancement therapies. And you see this, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, you see it's why people spend five hours in the gym, you know, <laughs> it's like, why else would you do that? I, uh, in, in response to the populism, thank you for that, I agree. I'm not sure, though, that I, I, would, I would agree per se, um, uh, with all respect, that what we've said isn't related to that, at least from the United States perspective. I, too, was quite taken by the claim that we need to put words in the right places, because at least in the U.S. context right now, um, words are not being put in the right places, and we have all kinds of strange statements being uttered, like alternative facts, truth isn't truth, um, these sorts of claims which, which are just puzzling, and it's difficult to figure out how to, how to reorient the conversation so that truth actually matters. And in one sense, I would see this as the logical concept. I, I think what's going on, although it's, there's, there's a debate right now, is it a symptom or is it a cause in the United States by some of us who are, are alarmed? And that is to say, are, is this the symptom of a lot of things that have become before and sort of its, its outgrowth, what we're seeing? Or is it something new and unique? I actually think it's both. And that's why we do need these sort of genealogical accounts of, of, of how power functions and how power has been rewarded rather than truth, goodness. Um, and, then, and then finally, your, your wonderful question about uh, liberty and how it gets flattened. I think that's true. I think, at least in, I, I, one of my concerns is, and I don't know how to get out of this, it's just a, it's just a bind, our understanding of freedom in the United States at least, and, and I think it's so it is in many other places, is fundamentally negative. Isaiah Berlin had this great lecture in 1958 on two concepts of liberty, where he said there's negative and positive liberty. Negative liberty is liberty from, I'm free only insofar as no one interferes with me. And so what that does is that creates this individuation, where my freedom is always dependent upon nobody interfering with my life. Uh, and there, there's two forms of this negative freedom. There's a, a libertarian freedom, and then there's a, what's called a liberal egalitarian freedom and, and also a, a republican form of it. But, but all of them, although they differ, they all have this idea that freedom always comes when no one interferes with my, my will's ability to affect reality. Berlin contrasted that with what he thought was a, a more religious view of liberty, which is liberty for. I'm free not when I'm free from, but when I'm free for something. My freedom isn't, it's not about choices, you know, that I have, when I go into the, the market, I have 250 choices of cereal, you know, it's overwhelming, you know, why do I need 250 choices of cereal? But that's what constitutes my freedom, supposedly. Um, you know, whereas, I, I love, uh, St. Athanasius used to say, uh, when he, he would spend time in the desert with the monks, and he would say, oh, the monks are the most free, 
because they eat the same thing every day and they're satisfied. You know what I think? What's just, that's what we need is that kind of simplicity to learn to be satisfied just with a, a freedom for the good, a freedom for God. So thank you for your question. You asked me a couple of questions about how I define some things. If I don't forget them, I think you wanted me to define how. Asked me how I define divinity or the divine. Okay. And uh, and liberty and freedom and justice within uh, uh, the framework you described. I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, like beyond the self, the human being looking beyond the self, looking at the divine. I mean, mm -hmm. not as opposed to secular looking at oneself. Right. Okay. So and can also we in regard to the mm -hmm. other idea of the shared, shared mm -hmm. val universal shared values. Right. I think they're connected too. Right. I think they're connected in ways that Dr. Stephen had also been talking about earlier. Um, so. Uh, well, I don't have a really clear answer. Uh, one of the, one of the, I guess, parts of the question, what, what came to my mind, what I thought you were asking was, if you sort of enter that state where your own existence is called into question, right? How do you define that which gives you purpose then, right? Or whatever it is that you discover. And I would think that that's not something that you're in a position to define because that's the thing that's going to define you. So the, ex the, the the way that's encountered is not as something that you can define or then choose to define. Um, and so for myself, I feel I, I consider myself a liberal for different reasons than a secular liberal. And it's because I think that God affirms the human being, right? And I've come to feel, right, I didn't, I don't want to say, I, I, I didn't methodologically define this, right? I've come to feel that, you know, God had created the human being and affirms the existence of the human being for reasons which we can actually see on the basis of the nature of the human being. And it does seem to me that moral responsibility, uh, freedom, and a kind of notion of the uh, the person as as a voluntary agent is is essential to that. I mean, right? Um, and so, a certain kind of liberalism follows. Not necessarily the kind of every kind of liberalism. I suppose there are different kinds. And I don't know that I have a clear answer uh, in terms of methodically defining human rights and and liberty and, and and justice and so forth. That's a big question. That's a big deal, right? Um, but I think it follows f from that, yeah. Um, and that's basically the same difficulty. I, I left unfairly with that thing, like it was so easy to talk about Rin and Lee. But you're right, that's the $60 million question, right? How can we arrive at a kind of universal or sort of common... Well, and, and, and what Confucius is saying is essentially in a certain sense we can't because we're always going to be involved in some kind of specific language, some way of expressing this, right? And, and all we can do is express it in a specific language, right? I, I can't talk in no language at all. I can't give my thoughts in, in, in some kind of super language which is universal. Everything expressible is, is in some language. So that leads me to the term that, you know, Dr. Michaela mentioned twice. Uh, I think yesterday and today, or many times, I don't know how many times, epistemic humility is very important. This is a great term that everybody should remember and, 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 and keep in their, you know, in their arsenal of useful terms. Ex epistemic humility, right? I, I like the term because it paves the way between a kind of a intolerant, arrogant sort of universalism and relativism, right? All the time we're putting ourselves into this binary where we think if, if what I believe isn't absolutely true, and if I'm not absolutely certain so that everybody has to agree with me, then the alternative is just total relativism and moral anarchy. You know, and this is a false dilemma, right? But how can, how is it a false, how can we avoid this false dilemma? Well, epistemic humility, right? I accept that I don't know the truth, but that doesn't mean I have to deny that truth exists at all. And that means that there's something left for me to discover. 
And I think we need to start thinking about this as a process of discovery. I think this is one of the things with the way I like about the way Nishitani thinks about religion, right? We think about it as a process of discovery and growth rather than as an identity, which then we become insecure about. And we, again, from something that Dr. Michaela talked about earlier, we want to deny or sort of evade our vulnerability, right? When, when we have an identity, and it's important to us that our identity is the right one, every single thing that can bring a, a, a cause us to question becomes a, a threat that we have to sort of eliminate, right? And then it's impossible for us to grow because we, first of all, we're 100% sure that we understand ourselves, right? I mean, many years ago, I was really insecure, and I thought I had to be 100% certain that I understood what real Islam was. Because if not, then it's a silly people who ask, well, what are you doing then? You don't even know you're, well, right? I have to accept this vulnerability. Then I can grow, right? Only when I, you know, accept that I don't know everything, then I can learn. Yeah. So I like epistemic humility. <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> Um, I would like to uh, just uh, to reiterate what uh, Bilal was uh, saying because actually when we planned for this panel discussion we, 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 are, uh, we were aware of creating the balance between the perspectives. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Sayer is not around. In fact, he was um, planned to talk about the Islamic worldview exactly as you've mentioned and uh, of course uh, in addition to that he, will, he was also supposed to bring a practical example not only from the Islamic worldview but also from the Ibrahimic you know, uh, religions based on the story of Ibrahim in the Quran, Ibrahim, Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham in the Quran, uh, in the Quran. Uh, but nevertheless, I uh, add my voice to you that is, uh, Islam is not the church, as you said. The religions and traditions and cultures differ in many ways, but we are here, of course, to think and deliberate and uh, share views, and of course, uh, at least we uh, develop some understandings uh, yeah. uh, with regards to the issue of uh, you know the, the the presentations or the 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 um, what, what have been said i'm not here defending the speakers <laughs> but just adding my 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 feeling and my own you know perspective with regards to whether these presentations are old or there is no contemporary you know uh, issues addressed uh, uh, when we think about the the title of the uh, of the of, of this discussion or the theme it's about fundamentals we purposely wanted that one and generally when we talk about the fundamentals of any you know uh, religion or ideology uh, perhaps it's it's difficult to say whether this is contemporary or not because they they, they are the fundamentals they will remain they will always remain as uh, fundamentals, you know, and uh, but, but uh, what what I really would like to hear from our distinguished speakers is the second component of <laughs> this theme that with regards to the modern challenges that uh, whether uh, Christianity, secularism and Islamic uh, perspective really face in terms of, you know, uh, uh, religious, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, ethical perspectives of modern issues how it could be tackled from these different perspectives. I would like now to uh, take uh, per perhaps a uh, uh, final ro uh, round of uh, questions, brief questions please, because now it's almost nine o'clock, so uh, we will allow perhaps uh, two questions please, if you have, or comments, brief comments or questions. Otherwise, I will ask our uh, distinguished speakers to uh, deliver their final uh, remarks. Is there anyone? Or? Yes, Abdullah. I would like to thank uh, the presenters. Uh, the, the theme is uh, splendid indeed. Uh, my question is as follows. It is to do with the title and uh, a point that was raised by Dr. Uh, Steve. He talked about the religious and the secular ethics. Don't you think that the secular ethics uh, emanates from the religious uh, ethics uh, fundamentally because uh, humans in their nature coexist uh, and deal with each other uh, spiritually speaking and they 
uh, conduct themselves in accordance with the religion, with the inborn kind of disposition. So would it be possible to say that uh, the secular ethics emanated from the religious uh, 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 ethics? Uh, would it be possible to uh, uh, perhaps uh, adopt uh, ideas that are outside the vicinity of the religion itself? Uh, would it be possible uh, to say that there are uh, secular ethics uh, and if we want to uh, uh, divide the two, would it be possible to be successful? So the question is uh, uh, to do with the link between the, the two. Thank you. Okay, so I now would uh, speakers to respond to this question. Uh, in fact, uh, my own uh, response, quick response to this, if you have attended with us the seminar, you would have heard something with regards to the roots of, uh, uh, you know, secular ethics as rooted in the religious ethics too. Uh, but I would like to allow the speakers to uh, respond to this. In one sense, I could respond saying, listen to Dr. Moad because I very much appreciated what he had to say about the pernicious distinction between religion and secular. And part of what I was was trying to argue uh, ineptly as I, I'm sure it was, was that um, we may have never been secular, that the secular is itself a religious ethic that can't recognize itself as religious. And one of the, one of the charitable things we can do is to point out that many of the secular ethics as they developed had this religious foundation uh, which is both a good and po a positive thing because it does provide uh, uh, the, the basis for conversation and at the same time I think allows for it it, it legitimates that theological ethics to be at the at the table I would I, and, and it's not only the definition, I mean, we talked about, I talked about the definition of the secular, but every time you try to give a definition of religion, it's so slippery that it almost includes everything. You know, what is religion? An ultimate concern. Well, I know people who are ultimately concerned about the strangest things, you know, so, so is that religion? Uh, and um, I have a friend, Bill Cavanaugh, who wrote a book called The Wars of Religion, precisely because what often happens is the secular policing, not, not, not the, the refusal to realize that the secular is itself a kind of religious, is that we begin to think, oh, those religious people, if left to themselves, they'll kill each other. So we need uh, the secular neutral realm, which will keep religious people from killing each other. To which I just always say, you know, there's been nothing more violent in the 19th and 20th century than states who had that idea. So maybe the, I mean, I, I just, when I go around and speak with religious people, I'm not frightened. I mean, you know, it's just, it's a, there's, a, there's a bond there. So I do think this idea that we distinguish violence in terms of what religion produces versus what the secular produces is another place that we really need to challenge this, this pernicious distinction. So thank you for your question. I think we really need to overcome this idea that is either the religion that is the problem or the secular that is the problem. I think we have to move beyond that and come up with cr criteria. And one and one of my criteria is how do how does a specific worldview, how does a specific um, thought system deal with vulnerability? How does a system deal with weaknesses? I think. When you observe how a person, how a community, how um, a theology or a religious community or what community soever, how they treat those who do not fit the ideal, this will tell you a lot about this community and this theology or political ideology. And I think this is what we really have to turn to overcome this, this binary thinking and um, these, um, yeah, this really, this binary constructions. But I would still make, <laughs> a, um, yeah, argue in favor of having a secular state in the sense of um, having differentiated spheres and have having differentiated institutions for the sake of having, of having a common framework where we can meet and where we can discuss. But the problem is when this framework becomes too substantialist and when this framework becomes not only secular but secularist 
as you mentioned before in the case of France we we always have to be we will never <laughs> immediately arrive in this lifetime at a perfect system and I'm always very careful when there's anything pretending to be perfect or ideal but our duty is as people of goodwill to work together and to come up with certain criteria that enable us to live together and to have public debates together on what is actually the good and what is the human being and I think one of the challenges especially for ethics is that we um, do not talk about the good anymore we come up with all kinds of very sophisticated um, theories and ideas but what is actually good what allows us to flourish and I guess we will have many ideas what this could mean but we need to come together and discuss it and have a place to do that well I think one of the things we left out and, and maybe one of the things that uh, Bilal had would have liked us to mention <laughs> yeah, maybe not I don't know that something that's associated with the term secular is that something that it seems almost um, inevitable and you can't we can't do anything about it's just that we living in a world which is much more cosmopolitan and much more mixed right and and in his book called the secular age charles taylor if i remember correctly it's been a while since i'd read it but he, he associates the secular age with the, the sort of s state of society and culture where religion becomes a choice rather than something which a person is basically compelled to by virtue of the community they were born into, right? I don't think that it's religion was never a choice before this sort of age, but I think that we are experiencing growing kind of uh, the growth of a global cultural condition where that's the case, right? And I think we can even call into question whether or not really we you know this notion of choice and freedom that a liberal society is supposed to have there's always coercive elements whether cultural or right, psychological and so forth but I think that uh, this is a condition which is affecting our region right and which I, I think maybe in, in, the, in the background of a lot of what's going on so there's some insecurity that's involved when everybody around you looks like they have the ability to drop out of the group right and you don't know who you are anymore, right? So this is sort of, I think the adjustment of, of thinking of how to be religious when it's up to you, <laughs> right? Is I think what's gonna be the next concern for Muslims and, and to thinking about how we relate to our religion and religions and so forth. Please, very in a very brief, yes, just, just very quick, quick comment. I just want to quote two verses of the Quran very quickly, very short ones. One, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Translation later. And uh, the second is لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدِّينِ قَدْ تَبَيْنَ الرُّشْرُ مِنَ الْغَيْ So I think this idea of freedom to um, be religious or not has, is fundamental to Islamic um, you know, teachings in the Quran. So as you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about it. I just wanted to to to, to refer to these two verses. Thank you. Um, uh, be, before uh, we end up this uh, session, I would like to give our distinguished uh, speakers uh, one minute to share with us their final comments, including one challenge, because we didn't give fair assessment or perhaps uh, you know a discussion to the issue of uh, challenges, uh, with the ec with the exception of Michaela, because she did mention <laughs> the the challenge, the modern challenge of good that it's not paid much uh, attention. So uh, I, I will start with you. So <laughs> it's one minute, please. <laughs> well, I give three challenges, actually, <laughs> for <Yeah>. ethics. <laughs> so how, what, how do we deal with um, reasoning, with rationality in an age where there doesn't seem to be enough space enough for rational discussion? You mentioned the fake news, uh, etc. So how can you really argue when the other is just saying, well, everything you're saying is just fake? How do you do that? And but really, the more <laughs> the deep crisis, I think, is really um, how do we think about life? How do we think about the good? How do we think about what 
being human really means from different perspectives and that we dare to ask this question again and that we really discuss it again, especially in face of the challenge um, um, of modern technologies, biotechnologies, transhumanism and posthumanism. I think there are things turning up that we've only known from Matrix so far <laughs> and, and other different kinds of films. And we really have to be aware of that. I'm sure we're going to face many challenges in the future, but what I fear coming is violence when politics is reduced to power and there's no rhetoric of persuasion. Our disagreements can't be resolved except through violence. And my, I, I worry that we're always, we're always trying to figure out, well, what's the problem with violence? And it seems, sometimes it seems real simple to me. The problem with violence is violence. You know, <laughs> just don't be violent. Uh, and so I really truly believe uh, in the U.S., especially I see this coming, how we're politically going to navigate some serious rifts and differences that have emanated from our inability to resolve our differences through reason or persuasion as opposed to bringing violence. So. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moath, please. I, d I really don't have anything to add uh, on top of this. I, I think I said enough. Thank you. And uh, we reached uh, the end of this uh, session. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for being here tonight. And uh, I really appreciate your commitment and your patience. Uh, at the same time, I would like to thank uh, our distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Michael Nulinger from Austria, Dr. Steve Long from uh, America, and uh, Dr. Muad from Qatar University. You are, again, I remind you, if you are really interested to come tomorrow to attend with us the, the presentations of uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul Majid Sghayer, who will talk about the Islamic perspective, the worldview, and some applied also perspective. You are welcome in this room exactly. So with this, uh, Assalamu alaikum and thank you very much. Thank you.